Hello everyone, this is Oscar Beckler. We're here in Seattle where it's snowed in, so I'm home with my kids who got their school canceled, and we're taking it easy today. Uh, this is a lecture I would normally give in my design class, but I'm going to keep it generically, you know, something that anybody can access and enjoy. And uh, this is really just to talk about a sort of global perspective on the subject of color, which is uh, very broad, and hopefully we touch on all the major bases, and to just give you a little sampling of all the ways that this can go forward. Uh, there's lots of, you know, emotion attached to it, and a lot of science. Uh, color is very complex in that way. So first off, let's talk about some of the problems that we have with color when we're learning it. I think uh, this is the first thing you encounter. When you're in elementary school, you got some dork kid, and this punk says, did you know black isn't even a color? It's just all the paints combined. And he feels like this is so cool that he said it. And uh, that's not necessarily true, but it tends to be something that we experiment uh, experience with pigments. And that's the first thing that kids play with when they play with color, is the idea of you're mixing paints together and other things like that. Hold on one second. Sorry, kids talking in the background. Uh, so, uh, you see this sometimes with pigments. A lot of times, kids' pigments are designed to mix in a certain way, but uh, more fancy art pigments, you'll see this where, for instance, alizarin crimson, which is a red, can be mixed with ultramarine blue, and it creates something of a black color. Uh, when you get to high school, you get a little more intelligent about color, and you still have uh, some smarmy jerk going, hey, did you know that white isn't even a color? It's just all the colors combined. And they think that this is like this mind-blowing thing that they can drop in the middle of a conversation. And to some extent, uh, this is true, but uh, I think it's sort of defining color in a narrow spectrum, if you will. Uh, what uh, this refers to is light. So the way light works is we see all the uh, light rays coming at us, and they bend in certain directions. And on one end of the scale, the light uh, wobble is very close. And on the other end, it starts getting slower. And when we combine all these together, we see white light. And if you split them, such as with the prism, we start seeing various shades of light. So when you see a red apple, what's actually happening is oftentimes white, pure light is hitting it from the sun, and, or you know, a light in your house. And the apple absorbs all the blue and all the green and all the yellow and all the pinks. And the only thing that reflects back at you is the red color. So hence, when it hits your eye, that's what we see, is sort of the one light ray that didn't get absorbed. But when we combine all those, we see white. Uh, when you get a little smarter, there's uh, a little more... Um, intelligence that goes into this, in my opinion. I think the Munsell chart is the best example of this. Uh, so the Munsell chart is a way that we can discuss color in a way that explicitly is about our ability to perceive color. And that's what I think is missing from those other two kids, is that they're not talking about color in a functionally usable way. Uh, the Munsell chart maps color on three vectors. First, we have our value. This goes from uh, 10 white to uh, 0 black. And that's our first vector. The next vector is our hue. So it's somewhere along here. It's going to be red or yellow or green or blue. And this maps on, I don't know, 12 vectors. And then our last one is the chroma how saturated it is. So uh, if it's pure blue, uh, it's very saturated. And if it's uh, not saturated at all, it goes back to gray. 
Now, as you go up or down the value chart and as you change your hue, these things can change as well. So, for instance, we're very good at perceiving lots of uh, colors down here um, when it's blue. So, when you get to a blue, at a two value, we can actually get up to like 14 or uh, different saturation levels. Whereas with yellow, once you get below five, there's not a lot of variation in how we can perceive yellow. But up here, uh, yellow at the highest value has many, many, many variations. So the interesting thing is this, this is divided up mathematically. Whenever there is enough change that we can perceive a difference in color or value or uh, saturation, then you add a step. So the funny thing about this is here's my uh, red-headed son, or my orange, my orange-haired son, and according to the Munsell chart, orange doesn't exist because uh, if you divide these up into mathematical steps, there's not enough of a jump between yellow and red to perceive a difference. So instead, it's just called yellow-red. Anyways, that's advanced color for you. So uh, the benefit of the Munsell chart is that if you can pinpoint any space in uh, reality and you can map out how saturated and how, what its value is and what its chroma is, you can just account for these three factors and theoretically match anything in reality. So let's talk about pixel math. This is the next aspect that we actually see a lot of uh, color usage in now because we all are on digital screens. You're watching this on a digital screen and it's covered in little pixels that perceive all this stuff. Uh, you can map a pixel from 0 to 1 uh, which would be 0 is black and 1 is white and another way you can do this is from 0 to 255 where 0 is black and uh, 255 is white. In other words if you count 0 there's 256 steps to this pi pixel. And this is known as additive color. So just to show you what that looks like here. Here I am in Photoshop and you can see this in our channels. All these channels are mapped from 0 to 1. Our red channel is pure white which is 1 or uh, also known as Uh, 255. Now let's say I take a square of this red channel and I invert it. Well, let's look at our RGB value. Notice that what is happening is no red pixels exist now. I can then do the same thing on green. And this is the absence of green. You'll notice that uh, it's subtracting these pixels. So with zero in this very dark blue square, what we're seeing is zero red and zero green. And then lastly, here in our blue channel, I'm going to invert that. And you can see the same thing. So when we have red and green added together, but no blue, it makes yellow. When we have yellow and blue added together, but no green, Oh, wait, that's not it. Which is it? Red and, when we take red and blue out of the equation, we have pure green. So right here, the only channel that's available is our green channel at 100%. Over here is our red channel at 100%, but with no yellow and no blue. So this is known as additive color. And it's fun to see some of the math that's involved in this. I'm going to create a new layer here. And... Let's just add a gradient across here. You might have seen up here, and you may have used this in the past, layer mode transfers in Photoshop. And all of these layer mode transfers actually are just a mathematical equation. So multiply is probably the best example. This goes from uh, black, a gradient of black to white, right? On this uh, layer, if we look at it in isolation, we have our black pixels.
And our black pixels have a value of 0, 0, and 0. What happens when you multiply something by 0? It is 0. So when this is set to multiply and it's multiplying over these other colors, over here where it's white, that's basically 1. What's anything multiplied by 1? Whatever it was. 10 multiplied by 1 is 1. So if I fill this entirely with white, you can see everything is getting multiplied by 1. In other words, no change is happening. If I multiply everything by 0, everything is 0. Additionally, we could have a layer set to additive, and that will literally add pixels on. Linear, color, uh, linear dodge is what this is known as. And I could just select this color, and this is going to add this amount of, it's going to add 255 green every time I color on this. So you can see that it's adding green. In some places, like here, that means we get entirely all of our coverage. In other places, it doesn't. Whoa. I can also set this to, uh, instead of setting that on a separate layer mode transfer, I can actually set it in my brush. Whee! And it's gonna add over here. So if I add this blue, you notice it's deleting everything. If I add this yellow, it'll delete stuff. Because what it's doing is adding those pixels together. It tops out at one and therefore disappears. Now, there's some stuff that's kind of interesting to see here. Uh, one thing is to understand how RGB math works. If you click in here, you might notice that there's a couple of different things that we see. Uh, one method of mapping this stuff is from zero to one. So oftentimes, uh, that's in 3D programs, you can see that. Another way of mapping this is from 0 to 255, which is another way of saying 0 to 100%. To tell you why that matters, we can look at this basically 8-bit number. Now, what happens when you have an 8-bit number? It's either 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 or 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And uh, technically, if we added all those up, it would be 8. Um, the way p uh, bitmap <laughs> The way bit math works is each one of these represents a power. So this is uh, 0 or 1. And next is 0 to 2. So if I have just these two bits, I can add, uh, I could have 1, 1, which would be uh, 1, 2, 3, which would equal 3. On the other hand, I could have 0 and 0, which would equal 4. I could have 1 and 0, which would be 2 plus 0, and that would be 2. Or I could have 0 plus 1, which would be 0 plus 1 equals 1. In other words, with these two bits, we can map out four different values, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now, if you extrapolate that for powers of 2, we have 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 100, uh, 64, 128. Or... Hey, there it is. Now, if I had a, if I had an eight-bit number that was one 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 one, that's the equivalent of saying 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus eight plus four plus two plus one equals 255. In other words, one 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 is the same thing as saying 255 or pure white. Similarly, zero 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 would equal zero. In other words, pure black. Any combination of these numbers can make any number from 0 to 255. And in this way, that's how pixel math is stored. Now, the next thing that's kind of cool to see here is how this works. So, one 8-bit number equals one color channel. So, we actually store three different numbers for red, green, and blue. So imagine eight numbers for red, eight numbers for green, and eight numbers for blue equaling zero to 255. Thank you. Uh, there's another way to store this, which is known as hexadecimal. Now hexadecimal 
adds several numbers so that instead of having a scale that goes from 0 to 9, we have a scale that goes from 0 to 16, or 0 to 15. In other words, 15, if you're counting 0, is 16 possible combinations. In other words, it's a power of 2 and therefore pleasant for computer math. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then A, B, C, D, E, and F are added to this keychain to give us more power. So if we see a hex color of uh, F2, 6D, and 7D, that's the equivalent of saying F2 is the red, 6D is the green, and 7D is the blue. Now here is a chart that I just grabbed off the internet that shows you how this works. Uh, from 0 to 15, or from 0 to F, if you want to think of that, we have four numbers that can be made out of any of these. So F is our highest number, and that's the equivalent of 11111. 0 is our lowest, which is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So if we have two of these, F2, that's the equivalent of an eight-digit number. In other words, lets us map out 0 to 255. So again, that's additive color. <clears throat> mm, three channels. Now, you can see basically how this works. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, color and print is different. And this goes back to that elementary school kid who's using a subtractive color model. Now, in subtractive color, we can see this by changing our color mode to CMYK. CMYK assumes that you have a white piece of paper and every drop of ink in a different color is going to slowly darken it. So if I now have the same channels, look, uh, let's turn all these off so we're dealing with just pure white. Let's modify or cyan to that. And notice that it's basically printed with cyan ink there. If I add some magenta, you'll notice that here it's printing magenta ink. And when you print magenta ink plus cyan ink, both of them darken it. So you end up with this area in between them that's darker. Yellow is going to darken it even further. And then black is our last channel, where, oops, where black is going to be literal black ink. Now in CMYK, you have something known as a rich black, where it means that uh, you'll notice that here we have black ink that's printed. But if you really want to make this rich, you have to print blue and red and a little bit of yellow on it too. There's formulas for the exact amount. But here is the darkest black, right? where it's black plus all these other colors to extra saturate, and just soak into that paper. Uh, color in biology is kind of interesting in that the way this works, and this is beyond my uh, quality, but basically what happens is light enters and you have these cones in your eyeballs and they determine a sort of on off switch for whether you're seeing something. The first cone is pure black and white, or luminance. And when it enters your eye, you sort of get this black and white picture. The next option, the next cone is your blue or yellow. Again, somebody in the comments. Please rate me to shreds if I'm getting this wrong. Uh, so next up, your eye can differentiate between blues and yellows in nature. And then lastly, you'll notice that we have the difference between green and red. And you can sort of understand why it goes in this order when you look at it. This gives us the best statement of where we are in our environment so that we know, you know where fresh water is, where other people are, where that bear is coming from out of the woods to kill us. This is the most valuable information for our survival. And that's why we have all these cool optical uh, powers. Uh, what's interesting is that as you get colorblind, this tends to be the first cone that people don't have. So uh, you can't differentiate between red and green as much, followed by blue and yellow. 32-bit color is a very interesting conundrum. No, that's not safe. 
No, it's not safe. You guys go to your room. Do you guys want to say hi to the camera? Hi. So 32-bit color is uh, this idea. Thank you for kicking me, bud. I'm just going to open up a recent HDR I've made. No, thank you. Please don't, please don't mess with that. So here you can see the advantage of 32-bit color. Uh, the problem with RGB <laughs> is that it maps things out from a scale of 0 to 255, and therefore you have 255 levels of brightness or darkness. That's not how the real world functions. In the real world, what we have is the ability to see the difference between your phone on lowest brightness. Uh, when you're in, the, you know, when you're in the middle of your room, and you're, when you're in bed at night and you should go to sleep, but you have your phone on its minimal brightness, you can still read everything on that. Compare that to the might of the sun, which is super, super bright. I shot this at Lake Washington, and. Uh, I shot this at Lake Washington, and uh, the benefit of it is that uh, with 32-bit color, you actually map out all of the data from brightness. From light to dark. So here's that uh, HDR, and what this does is, uh, I'm oversimplifying, but basically we have an extra channel here that represents luminance. And that channel represents a power that is just, again, it's from 0 to 255. And what it basically means is 0 to 128 is ne powers of negative 127 to 1. And then positive of that is powers of uh, uh, 1 to 128. So if you imagine an RGB value that is uh, 5, 5, and 5 to the power of negative 128, that's going to be a very, very small fractional decimal of like 0. 0.000001. On the other hand, you can have a uh, pixel that is 128 to the power of 128, or 255 to the power of 128, which is like a million, billion, billion, billion. Echo, you go do that. Now we can see this in our uh, image here. Hi, right, can you get the kids away from me for five minutes? I'm recording. I am recording. So if we go into the render settings here, I can grab my exposure. And you can see the difference here, which is if I go way, way down, eventually I have pixels for the entire sun mapped out. And I can go even darker. Now when you map these correctly, this becomes a sort of super photo that stores light data as if it were in the real world. And that's why, thank you for bearing with me while my kids are in around. And so that's why uh, this accurately captures the color data from this entire scene and is able to cast shadows just off of a photo, which is what we want. And if you accurately shoot these, look, these random 3D spheres, it's like they were on Lake Washington's campus the day I shot this. A little snowman.
Uh, linear light is another aspect of this, and basically uh, the problem that you have is that when we look at a monitor, that monitor space is something where uh, humans have a lot more ability to perceptually process color variance in the darks of an image. And so as a result, we run things through a gamma curve, which is basically the equivalent of smashing. It makes all the darks darker and the lights lighter. Uh, one of the easiest ways to just be a Photoshop noob is you go into Photoshop and you create, I don't know, You've got some gradients or something. Imagine this is a photo. And you just want this to pop a little more. So you go into your levels and you crank up the darks and you crank up the lights and then it's a little brighter. Uh, this is the a more customized version of what happens a lot of times, which is your image has all this data stored it's thrown into a computer and run through a gamma curve, which spits it out in a way that's more pleasing to look at, but it destroys some of those color variations and stops it from being... and stops it from being accurate to the real world. So you can crank up the gamma and it's nice and vibrant, but that's actually not what you want. Uh, the reason for this is because of pipelines. So a lot of times what you end up doing is shooting in linear space and you combine that linear video footage with linear rendered 3D assets and it spits out a combination of the monkey that you filmed plus the robot behind it. If you crank that monkey into what looks visually correct and then crank that robot into what's visually correct, they no longer are occupying the same color space and it just all falls apart. Uh, most of the time, you guys don't need to worry about this technical stuff. Uh, Macbeth charting is another way that you can get extremely accurate photos. This is just something I grabbed off the internet. Um, but you can see here, uh, this guy's holding what's known as a Macbeth chart. And what this is, is a photo that you can shoot before you shoot a photo. And all of these little squares are mapped to exact color data on a computer. Now, uh, different cameras plus different lenses plus different monitors plus different software can all add their own little uh, hot sauce to a color equation and too many cooks spoil the soup. So what this does is it forces all the colors in a photo to correspond to these and as a result you get a more accurate photo. Color spaces are uh, something that is mostly important in terms of how it's displayed on the monitor. Uh, but again, also how you're adding different color equations on top of each other. And you can see basically what this is mapping out is what is visibly possible within that. So certain things within CMYK are not actually possible to show. This uh, pink one here is CMYK. And guess what? A piece of paper will never be as bright as a light bulb. Uh, it's just not going to happen. In fact, if you have a light bulb in front of your face and a white piece of paper, the white paper will look dark black because of how blinded you're getting. sRGB is also very limited, as you can see. And again, that's just the issue that you're only able to map 256 variations of light and dark. Uh, Adobe RGB and then Profoto is the fancy one that is theoretically the best. Uh, again, kind of technical. But over here you can see uh, part of the reason that this matters. Uh, a lot of times if you just do something crazy like this, that's never going to come out in print as a really beautiful image in CMYK. Uh, Pantone is another option for print that oftentimes gives better results. And the benefit of this is that instead of having four printer heads for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black, instead it has depending on uh, which printer you're using, 14 inks. The benefit of which is much more vibrant colors and much more variation. So this is what you do if you are fancy. There's a Pantone color of the year every year. And frankly, print is my weak spot when it comes to color. So I can't speak too much to uh, this stuff, but Pantone is really nice. Color balance and white balance is another aspect of color that's uh, partially creative and partially an issue of reality. Uh, first off, your white balance is something where you can solve this by just clicking on something 
that is white. So, for instance, uh, yeah, sure, why not? So this is like a picture I took uh, somebody, or this is a drawing I did a couple years ago. And the problem is, oftentimes, if you're staring at a white piece of paper, or if your entire camera is just this blue piece of paper, your camera, if it's set to auto white balance, is going to freak out and say, oh, this must be blue light in a blue scene with blue, uh, blue hour dusk. I have no idea what I'm doing, so let's just crank everything to make the blue anti-blue. And the result is the color won't be as nice. So you can see what I just did there is in Lightroom here, I clicked on white balance for something that I know absolutely was actually white in the scene. And that recalibrates everything in this photo to be accurate to that. Uh, color balance is another aspect of this. Color, uh, color temperature is something that's mapped in kelvins. At 250K, you can see that it's very blue. And over at 1000K, you can see it's very warm. Uh, and this is something where it depends on the light in the scene. So uh, this is something that oftentimes is set automatically, but oftentimes you can set it if you know what your lighting scenario is. Uh, so, uh, you know, 250 Kelvin is something that you might see in the Arctic, and 1,000 Kelvin, maybe at sunset. Uh, on a more holistic level, color is something that's kind of enjoyable because certain combinations work better for our eyes. So analogous colors is one such category where colors that are close together on this color wheel tend to be something that we like to see in combination. Complementary colors, alternatively, are opposite colors. I can pause. What's up? So, complementary colors are uh, opposites of that. So, uh, red and yellow, or uh, orange and blue, are opposite this color wheel, and therefore are known as their complement. Purple and yellow, same thing. Red and green. Uh, double complementary is another way that you can look at this. And a lot of times I think it's fun to play with this stuff, but you should learn to sort of trust your instincts. And I think there's a couple of fun examples of this. Uh, Peloton.com is one thing I really like. And it basically is a way of finding analogous colors or complementary colors and then modifying it based on hue, saturation, or value. So for instance, I can very quickly move this around and get something that's very, very quick, dirty, and enjoyable. Again, you don't have to lock yourself into complementary and analogous colors forever. Uh, I always think of playground colors or Mondrian colors. Uh, you know, here on my glasses is a good example. This is triadic color uh, on my glasses. Um, so it's got blue, red, and yellow. But it's something that this generator will never give you, is that blue, red, and yellow. Um, I don't know, it's fun to play with. I think another thing that's fun to mess around with is uh, random colors. So just to show you a quick little demonstration file, this is a blend file that I have, or this is a 3D project I've been working on, which is a random road generator. And what's cool about it is its color actually is randomly generated. So you can see here that it creates a random number from 0 to 1, 0 to 1, and 0 to 1. And that ends up being the red, green, and blue on these materials. So all it has is a random red, a random green, and a random blue.
So, I don't know, I think uh, that's really kind of fun. And actually, this PowerPoint is an example of that as well. Uh, what do I have here? I'm using a random color generator in Google Slides, which just lets me randomly make colors. And I don't know, I think it's pretty fun. You can just go through here. Why do all the hard work of picking colors if you can start off random and just copy and paste it? There you go. Anyways, I hope this was informative, and we're going to talk more about colors when it stops snowing finally. Thanks.